Amazing. Good morning, everyone, and thank you to the team for a wonderful time of worship. That was really a blessing. Um, excited to be with you this morning for the start of our Christmas series, um, The Promise of Christmas. And uh, maybe I can just pray for us quickly as we, as we dive in. Yeah, Father, I just pray um, that you would capture our hearts this morning as we've been singing, God that you would capture our hearts, that we would offer up our lives to you every day, every season, every moment, that we would know we are yours, that you are ours, that we are your people and you are our God. And so will you give us eyes to see, hearts to feel, and minds to understand the promise that you have shared with us. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, I, I don't know what you think of when you hear the word promise, right? It's quite a common word we, we, we hear and use um, throughout our lives all the time. Maybe you think of the big promises, things we, we call vows, things like marriage and commitments maybe you've made to loved ones. Maybe you think of a, a, a promise like an oath. You know, we think of the, the Hippocratic Oath. Is that, have I said that right? I was worried I was going to say that wrong. Like medical oaths or oaths you take as you, if you're in civil service or, or in sort of national security oaths to give up your life, make sacrifices. Um, and what about maybe the most sacred promise of all, the pinky swear? I mean, there is just nothing. Like if you've broken the pinky swear, then you've just scraped in by the blood of Jesus because that is by far the most sacred promise we could we could ever make. I mean, promises for us, right, they're just a part of life. I mean, think of some of the promises we make on a daily basis. I promise to do the dishes. Um, or maybe you've heard this one, parents, I promise to clean my room uh, and whether that's been met. Or I promise for my work to meet that deadline, to hit that target. We make these kind of vows, promises, oaths um, at varying degrees of maybe importance. Um, and we make them all the time. And for some of us, maybe we hear the word promise and unfortunately, it brings up a memory of pain because all of us, again, at varying levels, have experienced what it's like to go through a broken promise or maybe to ourselves break a promise. And, and the extent of the promise often determines how much we can hurt we can feel, how sore it is. You know, if that promise was something really big, then breaking that promise or, or having a promise broken to us can be something that's really, really painful because... Here's what a promise really is, and I, I looked at the dictionary, so I'm, I'm pretty confident in this. A promise is the commitment to an outcome. It's the assurance that something is going to happen. It's the assurance of a result. Now, that might be an unconditional promise. Unconditionally, I assure you this will be the case. I sort of hope there's a bit of an unconditional promise with my doctor that they're going to look after me and that it's not dependent on my mood on the day and whether I've been polite or not. We sort of take that that's maybe an unconditional oath. I, I am going to put your life um, you know, at, at my most important when you come to me for help. Or conditional promises, you know, conditional promises. Maybe if you do this, I will do that. There's these sort of assurances and false promises. I mean, a good example, I was thinking ashamedly of, of something uh, that happened when I just came out of high school, I think in my latter years of high school, somewhere around that time. I'm quite bad with chronology. And, uh, and I sort of, a friend came up to me and he said, Ryan, I've just like got into this great thing and it's going to make so much money. Some of you are catching on very quickly. And all you got to do is you just got to buy in, right? And then we just go through, there's this awesome product. They send you a package every month. And then all you got to do is just get other people to join the program. And we all get healthy and we all make money. And I was like, wow, this sounds really good. Like, this sounds amazing. I, I, I can do that. And I went to my dad, who's like well into business, not that you need to be to see the floor of this plan. And he was like, Ryan, that's what we call a pyramid scheme, okay? It's a really bad thing. For those who don't know, a pyramid scheme is basically where they promise you an, an outcome that's unattainable, and then in the promise of getting that outcome, you end up trying to recruit people to these false promises, and you end up not making any money, and only the people at the top make money. It's a really bad thing to do. Uh, don't get involved in that. I'm pretty sure it's illegal in many forms in many places, but I almost fell for that. My friend, unfortunately, did. He eventually got out very early. He was like, okay, this was a dumb idea, and he managed to, to get out of that, but I just remember my dad saying, no, that's a false promise. There's no easy route to the money. You gotta, you gotta just get a job and work hard. I was like, okay, cool, yeah, yeah, okay. I'm, I'm learning my lesson. I understand. I understand. But that's the thing. A promise is a guarantee of a result. 
He said they were promising that if we, we do these simple things, we're going to get this, this unobtainable result. But that's not how life works. It's the assurance of an outcome. It's saying this will be the case. And so what exactly for us then, as we come to this series, as we come to the Christmas season, what exactly is the promise of Christmas? And more importantly, how does it impact us today? How does it matter for us today? What is the assurance? What is the certainty that God has given to us, his people, as a promise for us this Christmas and for every day after? Um, as I was doing my research, I came across a guy named, I hope I say his name well, Jason Derushi, and he just said this. He said, what we anticipate tomorrow changes who we are today. Like what we anticipate, what we expect tomorrow will change who we are and how we act today. That's why this matters. That's why knowing what we believe about the hope of God's promise impacts how we're going to live today. The outcome that we expect dictates our actions beforehand. You know, I was thinking of, of some places that this, this comes out. For me, um, the first example I thought of was when I was studying in, in university, and I used to do this thing that, you know, it's pro probably not great, but it got me through, uh, called spotting. Has anyone heard of spotting before? Okay, well, I'm going to teach you something that probably is not helpful. Um, spotting, it's not, it's not when you're in the gym and they're spotting your lift. Spotting was something we do where, so if you were taking a course, let's say, for example, pulling one out of a hat, Hebrew, um, and you were, you were studying Hebrew and you had an exam coming up. Now you've got a whole stack of you know, in material to cover. You've got to learn a whole bunch of things. And so what we would do is because we had access to all the previous year's exams, I would go and get 10 years worth of exams. And then I'd go and count all the times questions came up in those exams. So if I saw a question came up 10 times out of 10, well, I knew I need to know that one very well. If it came up five times, I need to know it, but maybe it's not as high on my list of like studying, you know, sort of importance. And if it only came up once, I probably just didn't study it at all and hope it didn't come out. And so that was sort of the thing. The, the expectation I had impacted the way that I, some of you have a very low view of me right now. This is, <laughs> this is not going well. Jason, you need to take over. This is, uh, I've lost them. Um, uh, yeah, it's about managing your time and your resources effectively. Okay. Um, it did go badly for me. The reason I chose Hebrew is because that was one time where, you know, my anticipation was wrong. And so I, in trying to do that, it went badly and I ended up almost flunking my Hebrew paper. Greek's better anyway. Um, another, another time you see this is when you know that the fuel prices are going up. I mean, I used to see this all the time. Does anyone remember? Has anyone experienced this? You get this huge thing, oh, the fuel prices are about to go up like so big. And then you try to go to the gas station. And there's like this massive queue because everyone's trying to fill up. Now, all of a sudden, we're trying to like, you know, save a buck. Um, or I remember when we had a drought in Cape Town and then people were going into the shops and buying like big jugs of water and trying to stock up because they go, well, we're anticipating a lack. And so we need to act now. And it's impacting who we are. It's, may, it's impacting how we're living and it's impacting our actions. And so what we anticipate when it comes to the promise of Christmas. What we anticipate when it comes to the promises of God will change who we are today. It, it drastically changes who we are and how we live today. And that's why this matters. If we want to find the rest for our soul and life to the fullest, then we need to grab hold of the promise of Christmas. We need to grab hold of of the promise of Christmas. And to understand the promise of Christmas, we need to understand promise as it's taught in the Bible. Because this idea of the promise of God is actually not just a thread through the scriptures, it's one of the golden threads. I'm trying to make it sound important here because it is, right? It's a golden thread. It's something that carries right through the whole Bible. And we know the biblical story. We know that God is a God who has always existed, creates out of his goodness, and then humanity rebels. And what we do in that moment, and this is important, is one of the ways the Bible speaks about that rebellion is that we invite sin into the world and we invite specifically the curse of sin. It speaks about sin as a curse, 
about, at the consequences it has on this world and on us as humans and on us as people who are meant to relate to God. And so if you're reading the Bible, first book, Genesis, Genesis chapter 1 all the way through to Genesis chapter 11 is all about how God created, humanity rebelled, sin and the curse of sin was invited into the world and we see a deterioration, that was terrible, a deterioration of the consequences of that. In the family unit, in the marriage, in humanity's relation to one another, in our pride, in society, there's this, just this devolving of the curse of sin impacting the world. And then we get to Genesis chapter 12. It's coming, don't worry. Where God makes a promise to bless humanity again. Because the opposite in the Bible, the opposite of curse is blessing. At the end of Deuteronomy, that's what Moses says to God's people. He says, I place before you two choices, life and death, blessing and cursing. Following God's covenant would lead to life and blessing. Not following his covenant led to death and cursing. Right? That's how the Bible language worked. And so in the first time we pick this up, as, as God comes in, in Genesis chapter 12, we're introduced to a key character, Abram who gets renamed Abraham, and he receives this promise from God. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Here's the key. God has made a promise to humanity that through this person, Abraham, he would restore the blessing that was lost because of the curse of sin. That when we rebelled, we invited the curse of sin into this world and everything that's wrong with this world is because of that. But God gave a promise to this one person and he said, through you, I will bring blessing again. Humanity will know my blessing and there's a threefold promise that Abraham would be made a great nation, he would be made a great name, and he would have that great impact to bring God's blessing to the world. And so we track through it, and, and we can track through it quite quickly because we see that there's the child of promise, right? God makes this promise of a descendant, and we get Isaac. And then Isaac has the two children, Esau and Jacob. And Jacob gets renamed to Israel because he's now the continuation of of the promise. And, and here's the, just to take a break, here's the way this works. Because, excuse me, I was thinking about this. It's not kind of like, what are the name of those dolls? You know those dolls that start big and then they get really small as you take them out? And we can sometimes think, well, maybe the promise is like that. It's getting smaller as it's going along. No, it's actually more like that game we play in often around Christmas where you, you wrap a big chocolate, but then you keep wrapping it and there's little chocolates. And, and so every time the promise gets passed on, you're unwrapping it and you're getting a little taste. You're getting some chocolate, but right at the end, you get the big chocolate, right? Whoever has the, the parcel, when you pass it around and, and get it, you get the big chocolate. That's what's happening. The promise is getting refined. It's getting revealed as it's passed on. And so it's gone from Abraham to his son Isaac to Jacob who gets renamed Israel. And he has 12 sons, which we then call the 12 tribes of Israel, the nation. The nation. And one of those tribes is the tribe of Judah. And from that tribe will come a king who will play a critical role in bringing this promise. The king David. And then he's given another layer to this promise that from his line, from his descendancy, would be someone who sits on an eternal throne. And this person would be what they call the anointed one, the Messiah, in Greek, the Christ, who would bring blessing restored to humanity. He would sit on the stone and restore God's kingdom, which is why when we get then to the New Testament, Jesus can say with Astounding authority. I have come. I have come to fulfill the law and the prophets. That's in Matthew chapter 5. Or in John chapter 5 when he's rebuking the Pharisees. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you find life. But you're missing it because they testify to me. They testify to me. In, in our youth curriculum, often on a Sunday, we go through what we call the story of the Bible, and we have 10 parts to it. 
And so the parts are, you know, there is a God. He creates, okay, and everything is good. There's perfect harmony, but there's disobedience, which leads to the consequence, or what I've said is the curse of sin. And therefore, we're in need of rescue. We're in need of of God restoring his blessing. But the next two parts of this, that God makes a promise, promise made, and in Jesus, God keeps the promise. But the promise made bit is often so ignored because that's the whole point of the Old Testament. I mean, you miss the depths of the beauty of God in the Old Testament when you don't realize all of it's there to show you he's working out his promise to Jesus. He's working it through. And so the coming of Jesus, his life, his death, his resurrection, beginning with Christmas, is the fulfillment of God's promise of blessing to humanity so that Paul can say in Acts, we tell you the good news, the gospel, what God promised our ancestors, he has fulfilled for us, their children, by raising up Jesus. God's promise of restoration and blessing has come through Jesus. I mean, it's, it's, just, it's, it's so difficult for us to do this, but to try and step back and look at the scope of history and go, what God promised to that one person, Abram, thousands of years ago, Thousands of years ago, he he made this promise, he made this commitment, he made this vow, and he's seen it through all the way to be fulfilled thousands of years later in Jesus. And this brings us to one of one of the key truths for our Christmas series, for the series of promise. One of the framing truths for us to hold on and to celebrate. It's this: God is always, always, always faithful to his promises. I couldn't fit always in there three times, but I wanted to. That's what we learn when we look at the reality of Jesus fulfilling the promise given thousands of years ago to Abraham and how that's carried through. And do a study on this. It's beautiful to see how God carries. The book of Ruth seems so so strange, and the book of Esther seems so strange until you realize they're there to show you God is faithful to his promises, and he's carrying it through. And when Jesus comes, it's exclamation point, delivered, fulfilled. He has brought it to completion and at great cost to himself. You see, it's not only good news, the promise of Christmas, because of the promise itself, but because of what it says about the God who promised it. He's faithful, trustworthy, never made a broken promise, never gives false hope, always reliable. He comes through on his word. There is nothing more certain than the promises of God, not even the air that we breathe. There is nothing more certain than the promises of God. He carried through this promise for hundreds of generations to its fulfillment because that is who he is. With Abram, he made a pinky swear and he's delivered. He's delivered. When God promises something, it's as good as done. I was looking for some illustrations, and I, I found this story of um, that this very short story. This guy tells he says that there were these two two young children, and they were chatting, and they were talking about their pocket money. And they said, and the one child asked the other, "Well, how much do you have?" And they said, "Well, well, I have a pound." And they said, "Well, actually, in your hand, you've only got fifty p." And they said, "Yes, but my dad promised to give me fifty p tonight." And it was because they knew it was basically theirs already. Some of the more financially minded in us were going, oh, be careful, you know, don't count. But, but with God, we can count our chickens before they've hatched. Amen. We can. With God, we can count our chickens before they've hatched because a promise from God is as sure as done. And to that girl, she just knew, if dad says I get an extra 50p when I get home, I'm getting my 50p when I get home because he keeps his word. We can have perfect confidence in God's promises because of his perfect character. He has a perfect record. I was thinking about um, when, I, when I used to be in, in um, Cape Town, and we used to, um, actually, I was in my hometown. It was in East London in South Africa, and it was a beach town, and so I did a bit of surfing. And one of the things we would do, because we were students and couldn't drive yet, and we needed to get to the beach, is we would hitchhike, okay, which is not the safest thing to do in the world, but... That's just how we got around. And so that's what we would do. We would go with our boards and we'd wait till we saw you know, a car that was big enough to carry three surfboards and three teenage guys. And, um, 
and we'd stick out our thumb and, and they'd pull over. And every now and again, you sort of think to yourself, this could go horribly wrong. There's some terrible movies that start like this. But, but, but that was sort of what we would do. And, and, and the reality is our, our, our sort of confidence in getting to the destination was sort of rested on who the driver was. You know, and we didn't know, so there wasn't like this crazy confidence. I mean, we weren't overly concerned. Um, maybe we should have been a bit more cautious, but we weren't overly concerned. We, but, but that's the reality. We didn't know the driver, and we were placing our trust in this driver to get us from A to B, which is slightly different than if you start to get an Uber, because what do they have on these sort of travel apps? Well, they have reviews, and people can go and write comments, and so you can see, oh, this person's done you know, 1,000, 10,000 trips, and they've got a 4.9 star review, so they're probably a nice person. They're not going to kidnap me. This is going to be okay. I can, I can put a bit more trust. But again, they're still a stranger. And then very different to when I was a kid waiting at school, knowing that my parents are going to come and fetch me and that they would be there, except for that one time at squash practice, but it's okay. That's what we have therapy for. <laughs> um, no parents are perfect. It's okay. Um, I said I wasn't going to say that, but now it's happened. Um, but, but again, the reliability I had in my parents to get me from school to home, from A to B, was just the confidence was so much higher, so much higher. And it's because our confidence in the outcome is as high as my confidence was in the driver, the one who makes the promise to get you there. See, it's God's character, who he is, that gives us the confidence to know he will deliver on what he's promised. He will get us from A to B. And so this leads us to a key question, which we've almost half answered just in saying that. How do we access God's promises? How do we get there? How do we get the blessing of this promise? Well, I'm going to touch on just three of these verses quickly. I just want to read through them uh, that, we've, that, we're, that are on our, our sheets that you'll get at the end of the service. Romans 4 verse 16 says for this, Therefore, the promise comes by faith. So that, it may, so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only those who are of the law, but also to those who have the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. Galatians, Paul says this, He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of of the Spirit, and then in Hebrews chapter 6, we want each of you to show the same diligence to the very end, so that what you hope for may be fully realized. We do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. And you've probably seen there the key. The key is simple, faith. Faith is the key that unlocks the door to what God has promised. It comes by faith, the promise. It's received by faith, is what it says in Galatians. And then in Hebrews, we inherit it through faith. Faith is the key. But, but here's, the, here's the thing, and it comes almost back to what I was sharing about, about the driver. Because it's important we get to the heart of what faith means in the Bible. Unfortunately, this word faith can be a little bit robbed of meaning because of how it's been used in religious circles. You see, it, it becomes something a bit different to what it actually means in the scriptures. Because faith in the Bible is trust. It's trust. It's relational confidence or relational reliance. Do you see the difference? It's not just belief or credence. It's not just we agree with something. It's the same way as when, when your spouse or your child or your parent says, I trust you. Relational confidence and reliance. And so going back to the, the driving thing, well, the, the level of trust that I had with the, the person who picked me up when I was hitchhiking was very different to the relational trust that I had with my Uber driver. Some of them are very friendly, but then vastly different to the relational trust I had with my parents when they would give me lifts. Because the trust and faith spoken of in the scriptures is like the faith we have with a child that trusts their parent, not the same faith they have in their textbook. They might believe that their textbook is right and true and gives them good facts, but they don't trust their textbook in the same way they trust their mom or their dad. 
They don't trust in that way. And so the key to unlocking God's promise is relational confidence. Heart trust. Not, I agree with you, God. I trust you, God. You see, trust gets you in the car. And that's how you get the promise A to B. And if we don't get in the car, if we don't have trust, you don't get where you want to go. You don't get the delivery of the promise. This is our second key truth. For us to experience, to enjoy the promises of God, it requires of us faith, trust. He is faithful to his promise and he is worthy of that trust. You see how these two relate. As we see the faithfulness of God, it's more, it's more easy for us to then be able to put our faith in him because he continues to prove himself trustworthy. And so the promise of blessing given to Abraham, fulfilled in Jesus, is accessed by us through faith. We have faith. We get the promise of the restored blessing. But not just that. This is actually a pattern that God sets for all of the promises of God. It's not just the promise of salvation. It's the promise of all of God's blessings that we get. So this is why Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. He says, for no matter how many promises. Do you see that? It's not just the one promise. It's not just the promise of blessing and deliverance. It's not just the promise of salvation. All the promises of God in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. All the promises of God, what does he say? Are yes in Christ. They are yes in Christ. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. That's why we say amen in Jesus' name. Because it's in him that we have access to anything we ask or hope for. And so it's not just the promise of salvation, but the promises that God gives us. That as we place our trust in Jesus and daily place our trust in Him, daily relationally rely on Him, we have accesses, access to all the promises of God in His Word. Every single one. The promise of blessing, yes. The promise of protection, yes. The promise of provision, yes. The promise of wisdom and guidance, yes, yes, yes. They are Ours today in Jesus. They are. And we experience these as we trust in God. And some of you would be asking the right question then. But what when we don't? Or what when we don't? What when I'm not protected? What when there's not provision? How do I, how do I deal with that? Is there a lack of my faith? Well, maybe. But there's definitely been some wonky teaching out of this passage. And here's the challenge for us. Because the reality of the Bible story for us today is that we live in an in-between time where Jesus has brought the promise, but its full realization hasn't been completed. Do you see that? There's this in-between time. Jesus has come, died, rose again, and so the promise has begun. Its fulfillment has begun, but it's not yet fully completed, which will happen when he comes again. And we call this in, in sort of theology, and you'll hear pastors, the now not yet principle. That we have access to the kingdom now, but it's not yet fully realized for us. Just yet. We have access but it's not yet fully delivered. And we live then in the tension of God's promises and their final and fullest completion. And so here's the challenge. Here's my encouragement to us today as we go into Christmas and think about the promises of God. Let's learn to trust in the tension. We need to learn to trust in the tension because with, with the tension, right, there's always a danger we go too far one way or too far the other. So we've seen this. Maybe some of you have experienced where people have gone too far to the one way and they've said, well, all of God's promises are yes, which means we, we have it now. It's guaranteed ours. And, and if we don't experience it, it's our fault. And that leads to a lot of hurt. 
But we can also go the other way and say, well, all of God's promises are going to come when Jesus returns and, and everything's wrapped up. So I don't really need to hope for any of that now. You know, there's no guarantee that everything's going to go well. There's no guarantee I'm going to be provided for or protected for today. You know, that's talking about the final kingdom when, when everything's restored and, and sickness is taken away and, and sin is taken away. But that's, that's living on the, on the other side of the tension. God calls us to live in the tension. To live in the tension. See, the Bible speaks about us having received a down payment of a future reality. And so we experience some of today the reality of the future kingdom. We get tastes and glimpses, but the challenge is can we trust? Can we remain hopeful? Can we remain trusting to say, God, I want to trust you for your promise of provision. I want to trust you for your promise of provision today. I want to trust you of your promise of protection and guidance and wisdom today. Because I know that promise is yes for me in Jesus. And although it's not completely guaranteed that I will experience that in this moment today, I know you're faithful and I'll experience it then. But I'm not going to just put my hope off until then. I'm going to trust you for today. I'm going to trust you for today. All of your promises. And that faith will unlock us to enjoy and experience. Because imagine what you miss out on when you put off your experience of God's promise to the end. Or you miss out on all of what he wants to provide for you now. You miss out on what all he wants to provide for you now. I was trying really desperately to think of an illustration for this. The best I could come up with is that it's like we know there's a downpour coming, right? We know. We know, we know there's this like pouring out of God's blessing. And in the final day when Jesus returns and everything's restored, the blessing will come down in a downpour. I mean, it's hailing and downpour. I mean, in this, in this illustration, that's good, right? Okay, some of you are thinking, that sounds like a terrible day, um, terrible winter's day. No, it's like, it's good. It's like there's downpour and we want that. We want to be soaked and drenched in God's blessing. But today, until that final downpour, God opens up pockets, pockets of, of just pouring out his blessing. And those are accessed by faith because you've got to step into them. You've got to step into them. But if we don't, if we're just waiting for the downpour, we end up just living in an overcast shadow, not really experiencing the goodness of God promised to us, not experiencing it. And so we're allowed to, we're encouraged to, we're called to hope, trust, enjoy the promises of God today because we know that he's faithful. We know that he is faithful. And so I want to call us all to trust bravely. To trust bravely with courage. Say, I'm God, I'm going, to, I'm going to be vulnerable. I need this from you. It's what we see in the Psalms. It's why the Psalms are so resonant for us. Because we see people who are really calling out to God in their times of need. And they don't always get what they, what they need. But they always end with this. But I will hope in you. In who you are but we can hope in him and in his blessing. So let's learn to live in the tension of God's promise to us this Christmas. The promise of salvation that has been delivered and all the promises that are yes for us in Jesus and they're only yes to us because of him. Because of him, that baby born in a manger. So let me pray for us and then I'll invite the team up. And we can close in a song. Yes, God, we, we know the challenge of, of living in tension, of, of being sort of um, holding two sort of difficult things together and, and trying to live and trust in that space. But what we've already seen is that you are a God who is faithful to his word. That we know for 100% certainty that you are a God who is faithful to his word. The scriptures testify to that. History testifies to that. Jesus, his life, death, and resurrection testifies to the fact that you are a faithful God. And so we put our trust in you. And so we say with the person who said to Jesus, I believe Help my unbelief. May we have the courage to trust in daily moments 
for the things that we need from you, knowing that our access to them is only because of you, Jesus. But we know that we unlock that through trust. And so give us courage to trust you, God. Give us courage to trust you in every moment, in every day, with the promises of Christmas that we have in you. And and God, we know there might be some blocks to that, and that's something we're going to explore next week. But we just pray, God, even even before that, we just pray you would help us, make us us soft again, God, towards you, that we would get in the car and trust you because you're our heavenly Father and you are faithful to your word. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Why don't don't we stand and we're going to close with a song.